In this episode of the Project Management Podcast, we get emotional and discover how the soft skill of emotional intelligence helps us be better at the hard skills. Hello and welcome to the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com. This is episode 401 and I'm Cornelius Fichtner. Thank you for listening in. Those of you who have, will or are preparing for your PMP exam inevitably come across the term interpersonal skills. The Pimbok Guide mentions them, your prep books talk about them and you find me talking about them in my PMP exam prep training lessons as well. Leadership, team building, motivation, negotiation or trust building are some of the terms that you'll find. But there is another dimension to the soft skills that we project managers need, and that is emotional intelligence. Margaret Maloney has been coaching and training on the softer side of project management for a long time, and so I'm very happy to welcome her as our expert today. Hello, Margaret. Hi, good to be here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So to begin, uh, let's once again... Uh, do a definition here. Let's define emotional intelligence. What does emotional intelligence mean to you? The ability to monitor your emotions or the emotions of others and use this to guide your actions. A shorter way perhaps made to say this is to recognize and regulate emotions in ourselves and others. Mm. Where does it come from? Who first brought up the term, wrote about it? Well, I've traced this back to about 1964. Um, and it probably even goes back beyond that, but to somebody named Michael Beldock, who did a paper mm-hmm. on it. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly go through some of the, the parties involved. Then in 1989, there was somebody named Stanley Greenspan who created a model to help describe what emotional intelligence was. This was picked up and used by Peter Salovey and John Mayer, not the singer. Uh, and then we get to Daniel Goldman. and. If you use your favorite search engine and look up emotional intelligence, you're probably going to see a lot more about Daniel Mm -hmm. Goleman than any of these other parties, although some of them are still actively involved in this field. But the reason you're going to see Daniel Goleman is he is very smart and he named one of his first book, EQ, Emotional Intelligence. And for those of us in the business world, he might be a little bit more of our go-to resource because he writes articles for Harvard Business Review and Forbes and others on a regular basis. And what is the correct abbreviation, please? Is the correct abbreviation EI or is it EQ or does it even matter? Well, I might get in trouble here with with someone. (laughs) That's the risk I take when I say these things. Uh, I say tomato, tomato. Right. But what I will tell you is that I did run across one researcher who did use them differently. And when he did, he used EI to discuss what we are born with and a potential that we are born with. Mm -hmm. And he used EQ to talk about later our actual practical application of these skills. That being said, 99.9% of the time I say EQ. Okay, so whether you say EQ or EI, you mean emotional intelligence. I I prefer EQ myself, mm-hmm. but that's just because that's the one I have grown up with. Exactly, today. exactly. Yeah. Uh, why is emotional intelligence important to us project managers? It is a significant differentiator in our success. And I'm going to just bounce some some statistics off of you. I, I borrowed these statistics from a man named Travis Bradbury, who also does some work in this area. And basically, there is some finding that 58% of our success ties to our ability to be emotionally intelligent. And that's pretty high. And in addition, that if you look at people who are top performers, who are considered to be successful, that 90% of them rate high in EQ or higher than their colleagues. And this one, now, I'm going to bring this one up. I'm not sure that I am completely bought into this, but I want to bring it up because I find it to be very interesting. 
that there's an indicator that goes so far as to say that for each point that we increase our EQ, we might be paid $1,300 more in our salary. Now, I didn't go peel back the layers of that research, so I don't know if we could really make a case for that. But I think these statistics together, what they are illustrating is that there is a theme and that we are going to experience more success when we are able to control our emotions and recognize what's going on with others so that we can behave accordingly. Okay, those are impressive numbers, but I have some other numbers for you here, okay. and those are numbers that are of interest to the project manager and, and the, the project sponsor, and that those are earned value numbers. That's the budget. That's the date on which I have to deliver. Those are key performance indicators. It's the scope. Do I really need emotional intelligence to be more successful on that? This is the ultimate... Um soft skills versus hard skills conversation, I think, or, or question. So if I'm just really high with my EQ, can I just forget about my earned value? No, because there's an expectation that I'm able to use my emotional intelligence to guide the team to hit the goals that we have agreed upon. And so if I'm just like, really fun to be around and I get along well with people but my team isn't performing that is going to come back to haunt me most likely conversely if I am all about the numbers and I am a misery to work with in many fields that is also going to come back to haunt me and so I think that EQ is like the ultimate integration of our soft skills and our technical skills you know so for example Let's say you're my sponsor, and I do need to come into a status meeting and give you an update and tell you that we missed something in estimating, and we're going to be over budget. If I happen to know, if I've done my work and I, I've had a chance to get to know you, and I happen to understand that budget is a hot button for you, I hope that I'm going to draw upon my emotional intelligence to find the best way to present this information to you. I need to tell you, I need to tell you the truth. It's not okay for me to hide this, but perhaps I can do it in a different way rather than blurting out to you, you know, Cornelius, we were absolutely wrong and we're $50,000 off and that's just how it is. All right. With all of that out of the way, we now want to turn our attention to the PIMBOK guide. It has a long list of knowledge areas that it covers and what we want to do is go through them. Uh, maybe we'll touch all upon all of them. Maybe we'll skip one or two here or there. And you have prepared an example for us on how we project managers use emotional intelligence in these knowledge areas. We've already heard one from cost. So let's not start with project integration management. That definitely we want to do last mm -hmm. uh, because we first want to learn about all the others and then integrate it. So let's uh, turn our attention to scope, project scope management. How do we use emotional intelligence in scope management? Well, and you know, in scope management, when it's that time when we are preparing the scope and we're trying to get the definition clear and people are beginning to get antsy, when are you going to get this nailed down? Come on, hurry up. And people are feeling pressured to agree to the scope and move on. Maybe that doesn't happen to all of you, but I've certainly seen it plenty of times. And you see a stakeholder who appears to be unhappy, but doesn't want to stand up to the momentum, you know, and, and wants to go along and sign it but you can see that they're unhappy and they're signing off grudgingly. What do you do? Do you just say, oh, well, they signed it, so too bad about them? Or do you follow up with them to find out? You seemed unhappy with the scope. I just want to come back to you. And no matter what, if there's an issue, let's work through it now because it's going to haunt us later. So you see, that's a way of uh, you know sensing in the scope process that. You think you really have it nailed, but you really don't because somebody's really not happy. What about project time management? You know, you're still my sponsor because I'm not going to let you get away from me. But now the important constraint is time. It's the deadline. And I can see that we are a forecast that we're going to be over by four days. I can see that my time is working overtime. My team, excuse me, is already working overtime. They're dog tired, if you'll pardon the expression. And... I don't know how I can get more out of them. And yet I know that the business need is we really need this and we can't be late. I'm going to really need to draw upon my emotional intelligence to work with all of you to help come up with a solution. It's likely the solution may 
still involve asking the team to give more. It may involve asking you to maybe concede to two days late. I may need to ask you, can we bring in some temp labor and, you know, increase the budgets, but in order to help you know, with the team. And I may have to remind everyone that a team who's really pushed and overtired is likely to have some quality issues and some illness issues. And so, you know, I'm really going to need to pull on what I'm feeling, by the way, at the time, which is I'm freaking out and pull on all of that so that we can all sit down and come up with a solution. Earlier on, you've already given us an example for cost management. Do you have a second example for us? Well, Let's say, so you as my sponsor, let's say you are super helpful. And one of the ways in which you are so helpful is you give us some estimates. We're in the middle of estimating. And you used to work in a certain area and you used to purchase a certain kind of material. And so you say, you know, I want to help you out. And you don't need to go research these estimates because I know this is how much these materials cost. And my subject matter expert looks at your estimates and <laughs> can go immediately to the supplier that we use for those materials and prove that your estimates are wrong. Because that's not in any way awkward because you're the sponsor and you're trying to help us and you used to work in this area and you're wrong and my subject matter expert can prove that you're wrong and I don't want to move forward with your estimates because I'm going to be off in the budget and sooner or later I'm going to have to say why. And so you can see where I might have to draw on my emotional intelligence to, how do I do this? Do I just not use your estimates and hope you don't notice? Do I sit down with you privately? Bringing, do I bring the subject matter expert into it? Or does that going to embarrass you? Or do I just bring you a printout to say, look what's happened? Or you know, we're obligated to use this specific vendor, and that's how much these materials cost at this vendor? I've got to pick the best way to handle this. How do we use emotional intelligence in the area of quality management? Let's say that um, I am at a CMMMI level four or even no five, where we use auditors. And uh, we have an auditor assigned to me as a project manager. And um, the QA auditor, uh, I work sometimes, we call them QA reviewers. Their job is to review how I'm running the project to make sure that I'm following the processes that we say we're going to use to run a project. And my QA auditor or reviewer finds a problem in my project management plan. My project management plan has already been signed. My sponsor and stakeholders are happy and we moved on. But in the eyes of the QA auditor, this is not okay. And the conflict is that their job is to make sure that I'm doing things and following the process and I want to try to follow the process, and I didn't make a mistake on purpose, but now we've moved on, and I don't see the value in falling back and spending time and updating a plan that everybody seems to be fine with and they're using. Now, this auditor and I and perhaps others, we need to sit down and, and discuss what is really the best thing for the project without it being about me saying, that's silly, we've moved on, get over it, without the auditor saying, this is how it is, you must stick to it. So we're going to have to find a, a way to be able to sit down and talk about this. Then we have human resources management. And this is probably the area where everybody can see, oh, yeah, emotional intelligence, human resources. They probably go hand in hand. How do we as project managers, though, apply emotional intelligence here? What's, what example do you have for us? I don't even know if I'm going to give an example here, but we'll see. I, I think what I want to say here is that a tool and technique that we use in this area, interpersonal skills. And right. interpersonal skills is a large area, right? It's negotiations, it's conflict resolution, it's communications, but it's emotional intelligence. That's what allows me to have good relationships, good working relationships with other people is my emotional intelligence, which actually sees me through my conflict resolution, my negotiations, all of those things. Communications management. Now, this is where... This is where I'm going to throw myself under the bus and I'm going to, I'm going to just <laughs> confess. I like to say I make mistakes so you don't have to or you don't have to at least make the same mistakes I made. I made a mistake 
in my career, well, I've made many mistakes. A mistake I'd like to share with you now has to do with when I was newer in a role. When I was newer in a role, and I'll say the equivalent title that people might recognize is like a director. When I was newer as a director, but I was in IT, I made a mistake with my communication style. I didn't take into consideration my peers. My peers were now directors from other groups, from the various business units. And why this matters is that I really do think that part of my being a person who grew up in IT, so to speak, was I was very comfortable with my computer. And also with my, uh, I believe it or not, people, I tend to be a bit of an introvert. So I was very comfortable emailing. And I was emailing my peers all the time because I thought, this is great. You know, I can send them this email and then I don't have to interrupt, listen to this. I don't have to interrupt my day to go walk around and go see them, which will just take a huge chunk out of my day. I can sit here and be productive. So do you see my error and feel free to point it out? (laughs) I can see your error because my experience and my example is almost exactly the same. With the exception that I actually printed out that particular communication that still haunts me, walked into the developer's office and handed them a printed copy. So, yeah. Yeah. So I wasn't doing it the right way. And luckily, one day, one of my peer, and he said this to me in a very nice way. It was, he was joking, but I got it. He joked with me. He looked at me one day. He says, you know, Margaret. I sit one floor directly below you. You could cut a hole in the floor and talk to me. We could put in (laughs) stairs between our floors. We could put two tin cans in a string. Why don't you ever come see me? Why do you send me all these emails? And I got it. I got it immediately. Just the way in which he said it to me, I was like, I wasn't being intelligent or sensitive. I just was communicating the way that was best for me, but it wasn't best for them. So always adjust your communication method to what the recipients need, not what you need. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And see, that was a lack of emotional intelligence because I was thinking about me, 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 me. Okay. Risk management is next. Risk management is hard. It's facts. It's something can go wrong and we have to really figure out what might happen. Where does emotion play into this? Have you ever in the process of, you know, coming up with the of risks, maybe you're brainstorming and you're identifying risks. Have you ever had a team member call out something as a risk? And okay, hopefully nobody said this out loud, but in your head, you thought that's dumb. Like that will never happen. That's so <laughs> random. What is that risk really? And, and so, and the way I say it in class to make people laugh, I think, or maybe only to amuse myself as I say, you know, that risk that Godzilla is going to come on shore and, you know, stomp on our construction site. Like, I might feel really strongly about this. I really think Godzilla is going to come. It's time. We haven't seen Godzilla for a while. Okay. Right. So how do you, as the project manager, try to get me to get over it so that we can move on? And in this instance, I think, I really think this is an instance where aside from, you know, being emotionally intelligent and not telling me to my face that I'm absolutely bonkers, because even though I might be bonkers, there might be times where I actually have moments of great clarity and intelligence. And if you annoy me, I'm never going to share those with you again. I think this is a place where actually the processes that we use in risk management help, because if next, if you just take the risk from me and record it, great. Then later, when we prioritize risks and we say, you know, what's the probability, what's the impact, you can kind of gently step me away from Godzilla. (laughs) I love Godzilla. I do. Other people have heard me talk about Godzilla. Godzilla is fun. I have another one for you in risk management. This one actually happened to me, and I'm still not 100% sure how to solve this, uh, because during risk development, I realized that another person is a risk to our project. Uh And that person was in the room. So how do you, and by that, I don't mean, you know, the the person was incapable of doing their job. It was more like, what if he leaves, right? He is a critical resource. How do we deal with the fact that this critical resource here might be lost while, and, and how do you discuss that while that critical resource is in the room, right? Well, I think you can. I mean, again, now, so it goes back to your knowledge and of that person. But I think 
that I would start that conversation in terms of the role. And even though we might know that in this talking right. about this role, we all know I'm talking about you, Cornelius. <laughs> I can say we only have one person who knows how to run the magic thermal seismometer machine thing that I'm making up now. And that is a risk and discuss it. I mean, that person knows that they're the only person who does that job. And, and discussing it, hopefully, they'll understand that they're valuable. Hopefully, it won't encourage them to say, yeah, I'm going to leave. Or, yeah, now I'm going to ask you for more money. When, I mean, we want to be able to you know, count on them being a professional. But I don't think there's any reason to talk about it without them. In fact, my concern would be if I talk about it behind their back, then they're going to feel like, oh, they're going to try to replace me. Procurement management is next in the list. Okay. Ah, how do we act when procurement is taking longer than planned? This was definitely something that used to happen to me, especially when I was newer, but also because I worked at a company where maybe working with outside vendors was newer. So we never really knew how long it was going to take to sign a contract. And the problem with that is then, let's say I came up with a placeholder amount of time in the schedule, then we blew past that deadline. And now my conflict of interest is I now am late because I thought it would only take us three weeks to work out this contract because I thought it was simple and it's still with the procurement group and the legal team. And they will not tell me when it's going to be resolved. One, because they have some important key points that they need to hammer out and they don't want to make me any false promises. And I'm freaking out and getting stressed and... I want somebody to just hurry up and sign so we can move on. And so in this instance, you know, I have to really um, be aware, self-aware. One of the components of emotional intelligence, I need to be self-aware of where I'm coming from, which is I'm freaking out about the schedule. And I really need to exercise some self-control to not call people up and say, just sign it already. So I think that, you know, we can kind of see that one. And then maybe I need to do a better job communicating the risks of the schedule to other people and not say, oh, it'll be signed in three weeks. Let's move on to stakeholder management. And I can easily see that there are many trap doors and puddles I can step into when it comes to sensitivity and stakeholder management. What's your example? How do we use emotional intelligence as project managers? Mm. With our stakeholders. I mean, you're right, because it's just, it's all throughout our relationships. And so this is one area where it's, you know, we're really emphasizing our working relationships. Well, okay. What if you, in identifying stakeholders, you have a key stakeholder who you're already working with, and that key stakeholder says to you, oh, you know what, Margaret, you don't need to involve Cornelius in this project. I'll go ahead and, you know, represent him and we don't need to bother him and he doesn't need to be involved. And even though I know that that's wrong (laughs) and, you know, so politics come up. And by the way, I have worked with a few people who have tried that approach, either about a specific person or a specific group. Oh, you don't need to involve them. Don't worry about them. Their part in this is so small, they don't need to be represented. And so now what is the emotionally intelligent way to handle this? Do I just say, okay, and worry and see if things will blow up later? Do I come see you confidentially and say, hey, you know, this person is saying leave you out? Do I try to bring in other people to the conversation? So I think you see what I'm saying there. Politics. Let's bring it all together and integrate everything uh, in project integration management. Okay. Now I'm going to be a lot less literal. What I mean by that is I'm going to use integration in a way maybe that's a little less of an obvious tie to the PMBOK guide. I'm going to say this is the thread that ties it all together. So in that case, I guess that is tying to the PMBOK guide because integration is about how we make sure everything works together. So in terms of integration management, your emotional intelligence is with you. You walk through your entire day accessing your emotional intelligence in different ways. And by the way, with different degrees of ability to access your emotional intelligence, you know, you're tired, maybe you were up all night on the phone, helping the team resolve an issue and you're back in at six in the morning and somebody jumps into your pathway as you're walking to your office, you might want to snap at them because you're tired and it's more challenging. So your emotional intelligence is, is, 
the thread that ties together all of your working relationships. It's the basis behind how you present information. It's the basis behind how you work with someone who's having challenges, how you choose to communicate something. It really is. It's part of it. It's at the core of everything we do because I don't see a world where we can truly separate out our soft skills from our technical skills. We use them to support one another. Is there any one knowledge area that sticks out for you where you'd say, you know, this is the one where we project managers have to really apply and show our emotional intelligence the most? I don't think that I would tie it to a knowledge area. I would tie it to human behaviors and scenarios. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I already just said that we're walking around trying to draw on our emotional intelligence all the time. But I think that there are scenarios where it we really need stronger reserves. You know, happy, easy conversations, most of us can pull that off. <laughs> Challenging scenarios where you have a sponsor losing their temper with you in a meeting and you really feel like it's not fair and it's not your fault. Situations where you have team members coming to you and you're disappointed in the way they've handled something and now you feel like you have to clean up their mess. Those are the times that really put our emotional intelligence to the test. And those situations can happen during any time, any phase, any knowledge area, any process. A difficult situation can raise its head. We project managers, we also deal in knowledge management. Do you have an example for us that shows how emotional intelligence helps us in knowledge management? I think that it's... It's about knowing what to share and when, and also what not to share. Uh, For example, maybe many of us have worked with a person who really trades on knowledge as a currency and really loves to be around, be the one to walk around and tell everyone things that maybe they're not supposed to tell everyone, um, to share information that maybe they're not supposed to share. And this also goes back to our code of ethics too, by the way. But there are going to be times where as a project manager, You have information about something that's coming, but you're not supposed to tell the team yet. There might be that part of you that you feel like you want to be liked and you want to be a buddy. And so you want to give people a heads up and oops, you spill that information that you were supposed to keep confidential versus understanding that there could be a time where the team is going to come back and figure out that you knew something ahead of time and figure out that you didn't share it with them. And they might be upset with you, but really the best thing to do is to honor, honor the confidence. Uh, I think it also comes back to when we talk about um, organizational process assets, which I think of as our, like our company's secret sauce and expert judgment. That There's a lot of emotional intelligence that goes into understanding how to draw upon an, a process asset, when to recommend that a process, like a process or a template should be changed how to draw out people's um, expert judgment. So I'm going to stop because I think I'm over-explaining now. All right. The example that you and I gave in regards to emotional intelligence and communication management uh, was sort of negative. Both you and I made a mistake, mm-hmm. and, and we learned from that mistake, and by that means we grew our emotional intelligence, but we first had to run into a wall and and crash and burn. (laughs) Is Is there a better way of learning and improving our emotional intelligence? Well, the good news is with emotional intelligence, it, it, it can be learned. Um, I think maybe you're, you're maybe kind of asking that a little bit too. Uh, but going back to that specific situation, I will say I could have asked, So in that specific situation, for me to be emotionally intelligent would have been for me to recognize that um, not everybody wants to be communicated with in the way I like to be communicated with. So be self-aware about how I was comfortable with email and exhibit some self-control by not always using my favorite approach and understanding that my colleagues were motivated by different types of communication. And if I wanted to, and and then to be empathetic with what do they want? And how can I best respond to how they want? And so that I could build those relationships by reaching out to them in the way they wanted. Uh, So that would have started, this whole chain would have started with a little bit of self-awareness. The best thing I think about emotional intelligence 
is that we can learn it and grow it. It's not like you're not stuck the way you are. You are a coach and you help project managers in various areas uh, of their development throughout their career. And people can learn more about that on your website, margaretmaloney.com. How do you personally help project managers with their emotional intelligence? Sometimes it's just about raising their awareness that it's a real thing, it's not a buzzword, and it exists. And then more specifically, by talking through specific scenarios and either replaying them. So if this, if somebody's coming to me and saying, this situation happened, it didn't go well, how could it have gone better? Then it's replaying the situation and considering different ways in which the person I'm working with could have responded. And it's also sometimes planning in advance, not because I could sit down and plan a conversation with you, Cornelius, and you're going to act exactly the way I've scripted it in my head. But if I think it through in advance and I think, okay, here's a situation I need to bring to Cornelius. I know he's very sensitive about budgets. And I, in this situation, I need to share with him that we're going over budget then I can think through and plan in advance, what is the best way to have this conversation with you? So that happens a lot. Uh, A number one issue I think I see is um, basically helping take people outside of themselves and seeing things from another perspective, from somebody else's perspective. How would you describe the ideal project manager in regards to how he or she applies emotional intelligence on their projects? Well, shouldn't it be you? Because I'm talking to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you and there's actually, I, I don't think there's one ideal and I respect that, you know, this might not be the answer people were waiting for me to give, but I don't think there's one ideal because there's a place for each of us and our styles. Ideally, we become comfortable with who we are, comfortable in our own skin, We don't beat ourselves up. So you and I can laugh about our communication mistake right now. And we work to our strength. We work on our growth. And when we slip up, we acknowledge it and we move on. So we look at the situation, say, here's what I did. Here's what I could have done better. And then make a decision. Is this a way in which I'm going to work on my growth right now or not? And we support the growth of others. And I have a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek question for you at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you deal emotionally correctly with a situation where you are doing a very important interview with an expert, and then suddenly during the interview, your cat jumps onto your desks (laughs) and lies down on your keyboard? Oh, you heard that, (laughs) huh? Oh <laughs> she's just jumped up in the middle of our conversation as she's flat on my desk. Here. Oh, I thought you yes. actually meant my cat because. No, no, no. It's my cat oh, here oh. at my head. Okay, this is funny. So, okay. So first of all, dog lovers, we love dogs too. There just happen to be yes. cats in this situation. Ah. So I want to be sensitive to dog lovers and um, those of you who love ferrets and lizards and other animals. Uh, the reason I thought you were talking to me is because as we, you were starting to say that my cat came in the room and she has a bell. And so I don't know if you can hear the bell or not. Um, but so. <laughs> so both our cats are here right now. All right. Yeah, cats, I think, and emotional intelligence, this is a whole different uh, area of sensitivity and awareness because they have a different expectation of what's emotionally intelligent. And I think their expectation is that emotional intelligent means um, if I want to be on your keyboard, then get over it. That's what I think. (laughs) Just like my cat now walking around, shaking her head and rubbing up against things, which is only making the bell rattle more. And I would say that her perception would be, this is what I'm doing. And if you're emotionally intelligent, then you will just deal with it. And she's right, right. because I am just dealing with it. And I'm taking a picture as we speak right now of my cat. And we're going to put that into the student handbook so people can actually see the cat. And you see, and we are at the end. And what your cat is trying to tell you is that it's time to take a break. Uh, It is, but not before my final question for you. Can you recommend three to four actions to us that will help project managers boost their emotional intelligence on their projects? 
observe those who you see being successful, those who you see have successful, strong working relationships and are also successful in their careers. Because I think there can be the person at the office who everyone likes, but isn't particularly doing great things with their career. So look at that person who is well liked and it is obviously transferring into career success and note how they behave and not because you want to be a clone of them, but you want to see what it is they do and then find your way. It's weird when we 100% imitate others. It comes across as insincere. But see what they do and how can you put some of that into your way of being, which leads to observe yourself. Are you having situations or exchanges with people where you think you're not getting what you need to be getting from it? Or you can see that the other person is not getting what they need to get from it, that it feels off. And see if you can begin to note why it feels off. Ask others. So if there are others who you trust and you have the safety to do it, in other words, someone you trust who you feel safe and then they're not going to turn around and say, now we should put this in your review because you're right. You're not doing a good job with that. Like, I don't want want that. But is there somebody who you can say, could you watch how I talk to this person in this meeting and see if, see where you think I could have been different? Consider an assessment. And there are two resources I can point you at. I don't personally, you know, create assessments or, and, and sell assessments, but there's an assessment by somebody named Adele Lynn. It's an um, emotional intelligence assessment and also a workbook. And then she, you know, you answer questions and you get feedback in certain areas. And then it even gives you some tips what to do now. And uh, I mentioned Travis Bradbury earlier, B R D B U R Y. He also has some things that are similar. And I'm going to throw in an extra one. I'm a fan of journaling. And I don't mean that you have to keep a diary, but I'm a fan of keeping track. You know, on this date, during this conversation, this occurred, and then go back and see if you can find a pattern of where sometimes things don't go as smoothly as you think. And see if you can trace that to, you know, a specific behavior that surfaces. And I call those triggers. Is there something sometimes that triggers you to be less than your uh, best self? So that's my initial thoughts there. All right. In that case, Margaret, me and my cat, Vienna, thank you very much for having an old program today. You are very welcome. And I would say my cat thanks you, but she lost interest and left the room. (laughs) Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye, Margaret. Margaret Maloney helps project managers learn the skills and knowledge to navigate the art and science of project management. She is a business owner, coach, experienced project manager, and IT executive and she teaches for the Universities of Irvine and Los Angeles. Find out more at margaretmaloney.com. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Please visit pm-podcast.com for show notes, links, transcripts, and PDU information. Our email address is info at pm-podcast.com. And finally, we have this. Every project manager is a fool for at least five minutes each day. Project success is achieved by not exceeding that limit. Until next time.